Uh, yeah, so today is the day for a garage tour because I cleaned the shop so it doesn't look like a bomb went off in there. Perfect day to do a garage tour. So we're gonna give you a tour of the shop, show you all the tools, and then we will talk about all the builds, where they're at, what's broken, what's running, and what we're gonna be working on in the future. And then maybe we'll uh, do some donuts and shred around a little bit, break some stuff. So we'll start with the shop itself. This is probably the cleanest it's ever been, <laughs> at least in the last two years. Um, so a little history about this shop. I actually grew up on this property. Um, I moved here when I was eight years old. Um, and then my mom moved to town a few years ago and I bought the property from her. So this shop has been here since, I don't really know exactly, but it was built sometime in probably the 70s by somebody who wasn't exactly an expert <laughs> at construction. <laughs> um, also, there's a giant spruce tree outside that's completely destroyed the floor in here. So that's fun. Um, it's built out of trees. You might notice all the posts holding it up are just trees stuck in the dirt. <laughs> no ceiling, just some plastic to hold out most of the leaky roof drips. And uh, yeah, it does the trick, aside from the fact that it's very drafty in the winter. But that's why we have this monstrous wood stove, which was built by my friend Chris, who I learned the basics of fabrication from when I was a kid. And uh, he built this thing years ago. It can hold two foot long logs and it can hold a lot of them. So even on cold days, we can get this thing cranking and keep it toasty. And well, we can keep it toasty in about this much of the shop. That half's always cold. <laughs> so, you know, time for some upgrades there. But these wooden benches, have been here since I moved here. Most of the shelves and stuff were just already here. I've just kind of rearranged stuff. You know, every time I clean it, I rearrange a little bit and find a way to get a little more space out of it. So that's the history of the garage. Um, now we'll show you all the different tools we use and we will have links in the description to everything that we have a link for. Some of them are too old for that, like the lathe, but anything that's new enough to buy now, we'll have a link for it. The welding table. I don't know if you got, you might remember when we built that uh, a few months back. And just yesterday I added in some casters. So now it's a movable welding table, which is super nice. It is also now full of a whole bunch of new swag from Lincoln. So we've got the uh, 375 Tomahawk plasma cutter. We've got the TIG 200 square wave TIG welder and the Power MIG 210 MP MIG welder, which it's also multi-process, so you could set this up to do TIG as well, but since we have a dedicated TIG welder for doing AC TIG, uh, we just have this set up for MIG, which it does very well. Our old welding setup is this little guy right here, which is a Lincoln LE 31 MP. It's their uh, smallest, most compact multi-process welder and that one can do uh, multi-process as well, obviously. So it does MIG, TIG, and stick. Um, and we also have an aluminum spool gun set up for it. So you can do MIG aluminum, which is very finicky and difficult, but you can do everything with this one little welder, which is pretty cool. And uh, since we've upgraded everything, we are going to do a giveaway on this welder sometime soon. So. We'll give you the details of that when we have it set up, but we'll, uh, we'll be giving this whole setup away with the spool gun and the TIG setup and everything to one lucky winner. It even comes with the pre-installed sticker packs of everybody who's given us stuff. <laughs> so while we're here in this corner, this corner is always just kind of a storage spot in the shop. Um, you know, we often have whatever build we're not currently working on parked here. Like for example, the 2J mower, which we are still planning on working on that. It's just, the main thing is it's really hard to find a transmission for a 2J. Everybody wants them these days. So we're looking, we're still looking into options for that, but, uh, we should be getting started on that again soon. Um, but yesterday when I rearranged the shop, I was able to push it back in the corner here a little bit more and get us some more working space, but. We, uh, we also finally got a, um, 
air hose reel, so the air hose isn't always on the floor getting tripped over. You know, it's the little things in life, <laughs> little upgrades. Um, this chop saw right here has been an absolute monster. It is, uh, it's a very small, compact little chop saw and it looks like not much, but it's actually, uh, it's got a carbide blade like what you would see, carbide tipped blade like what you'd see on a chop saw for cutting wood, except it's made for cutting metal and um, it cuts it very fast and very clean as opposed to your usual abrasive wheel chop saw, which makes a really, well, first of all, it heats it up a lot and then it doesn't make the straightest cut in the world and this is just, it's way faster as well. Um, I'll do a demonstration here and, and show you what it does. But And this blade's actually quite worn out because I may have cut slightly hardened steel, which is not really <laughs> meant for that, but it still chops pretty dang good. So that thing, it's just a uh, little Makita unit that we found uh, on Amazon and it had good reviews so we went with it and it's been I had no complaints about it at all You see how fast and clean that saw cuts and It's basically cold to the touch immediately after cutting it super awesome. It's also one of the loudest things in the shop as well. Yeah, every time anyone uses it, we uh, say that uh, we're about to use the loud loud. <laughs> Just so that everybody knows to put on earplugs because this thing is truly obnoxious. Over here we have the lathe and drill press area. This drill press is a tiny little, I think I bought this when I was like 12 years old at a Cummins tool sale. I don't even know if those are a thing anymore. So it's basically a Harbor Freight quality drill press. Um, it's not the best, but you know, it does the trick. And uh, we've got a little vice thing for it that helps make it a little more useful. But um, we've got our cobalt drill bit set back here. If you're drilling metal, I highly recommend cobalt drill bits over, um, you know, titanium coated or whatever. They're much, much harder and last a lot longer. Um, also for drilling larger holes, some cobalt step drills can be super handy. And then of course, the lathe, you've all seen this many times. Also, I don't know if we've showed this. We've had this lathe since the summer, so like maybe six months. And that's like, that's a, I don't know, 20 pounds of shavings of, from making stuff on the lathe. Uh, I don't know how old this lathe is, no idea. Um, uh, my best guess is somewhere from like 40s or 50s. It's an Atlas lathe. They were also sold as a Craftsman, I believe. Atlas and Craftsman like uh, made made or sold the same lathe. Um, it has an updated quick change tool holder, which is very handy because you can just throw that tool on, lock it in, and then throw on a different tool. Um, right now the uh, Traverse gear is broken because I'm an idiot but luckily there's still replacement parts available. Which is kind of cool, really. Yeah, it's really cool. Actually, this is a brand new replacement part. I found somebody on eBay that makes a brand new upgraded Traverse gear set to this ancient lathe. Just shows you lathes, you know, they, uh, they never go out of style. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, we picked this up for about a thousand bucks from somebody on Marketplace and um, it's been it's been a really good lathe to learn on and start with, and uh, it does pretty much everything we'd want it to do. I even managed to successfully cut some threads with it the other day, which is cool. Um, and then, of course, there's the Piranha, which I don't really know uh, anything about how old this is or how much it would cost or really any kind of specifications on it, aside from it weighs a couple thousand pounds and uh, it'll chop through just about anything. Um, it has a shear in the middle that's about, uh, well, actually, I don't know how wide it is. But the shear in the middle can cut around 11 and a half inches wide up to half inch thick plate. And then the end here has the punch setup with all these different die sets for different size holes. Um, again, that is half inch thick capacity. 
Uh, it even has a couple of special ones like a square hole, which you have to line that one up nice and perfect or it'll explode. Um, we've also found ways to adapt this end for using both our dimple die sets and also for pressing things in and out occasionally. Um, and then this end of it has this little table with a nibbler. Um, so you can chop off little corners or chop a corner out of a piece or what have you. Um, I also have our tubing notcher bolted onto there because it's a very uh, sturdy and convenient location for it. Um, this can also mount on the welding table. There's mount points for it there as well, but I found that I like it on the Piranha because it's a little bit more out of the way. This is our Rogue Fab Versa notcher, uh, and it is a very, very good little tubing notcher. Uh, it's got a ton of angle uh, rotation. It's got a um, little dial to show you what, how many degrees, uh, what degree the angle you're, cut, you're notching is. Um, and then the little vise thing on it can clamp just about any size of tubing. And of course you can put different sized hole saws on the end to, uh, for, for notching different sizes of tubing. It's really easy to use, very compact and in terms of the tubing notcher world, very affordable. You can also adjust the height of this part to accommodate for bends or whatever. It's pretty good at uh, uh, accommodating weird shapes of tubing and uh, notching them. The only thing that it is a little bit tricky to do is really short pieces of tubing. If you need to notch a piece that's like three inches long, you can't really clamp it in there. I've found ways around that, like uh, putting a smaller diameter piece of tubing that the and then sliding it over it, clamping the small piece and then notching on the other one, but um, yeah, it's a very uh, appropriately named tool because it's a very versatile little notcher. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously we've got your average bench grinder here set up with a abrasive wheel on one side and a wire wheel on the other. Uh, hardly use that that much these days, but it's a handy little tool to have around. The reason we don't use that a lot these days is because of this glorious monster. This is uh, without a doubt the tool that I use the most on a daily basis because every other tool that I use, after I use it, I bring it here and touch it up. Or I just use it to make pieces, uh, you know, entirely on this tool. And um, we're also gonna do uh, a full description and uh, demonstration of this tool as well as our Rogue Fab Bender, and we'll have those on our other channel, GHPC2, so we'll have links for those as well. Also behind it, we have our um, Sendy Boneyard of all the broken pieces of suspension from the Barbie Jeep. And of course, our trusty Rogue Fab Tubing Bender. Um, we get a lot of questions about this, so like I said, we'll do a complete video and demonstrate some of the things that it can do. It's a, an excellent bender, very affordable, and uh, use it quite a lot, as you may have noticed. Rogue Fab also has all of these dimple dies. I haven't used this one yet, but I'm looking forward to it. This is the biggest one they have, and it's a monster. But yeah, they have all these dimple die sets all the way down to, actually there's one that's even a little smaller than this, but um, very handy for making super cool looking and very strong little pieces of um, relatively thin steel that's also very strong. When you use a dimple die, uh, you simultaneously decrease weight and increase strength on any given piece of metal because uh, you know you punch out the hole and you lose the weight of that chunk of steel. And then when you dimple it, that uh, dimple around the edge makes that plate more rigid because it'd be very hard to bend across that dimple. So that's a cool little um, feature to add onto, you know, little, little gussets and plates and skid plates and stuff like that. And then this whole half of the shop is basically uh, hand tools, you know, wrenches, pliers, all that sort of stuff. Um, hammers, the hammer drawer. Uh, every good shop needs a whole drawer full of hammers. It's important. Uh, and then underneath I have all sorts of parts and bolts. Nuts, this whole section here is just like nuts, bolts, supplies, you know, cotter pin assortments, electrical uh, stuff. But yeah, I, as you can tell, lots and lots of containers just full of different sizes of bolts, which, you know, 
super handy to have and just something you accumulate over time if you're a hoarder like me. <laughs> I have the shop set up much better now than it ever has been before. I mean, it's been a process over the years, but like this whole corner of the shop is like the, the fabrication corner. Obviously, that's most of what we do is building things out of metal. So all the metal working tools are on this side of the shop and the lathe, I made sure to keep it away from all the sparky spark making tools because it's not good for the lathe to get too much grit on it and stuff. So, um, you know, that's why it's set up next to the drill press and the piranha. And then the chop saw is set up in the middle over here so that if you have a long piece of steel, you can fit it on either side. And it's also on its own stand out in front of the bench for the same reason, because if it was on the bench, it would run into the lathe and stuff like that. And this also doesn't really make any sparks. We also have a tubing roller that bolts right here. You've probably seen that. Um, it's actually not here right now. Friend is borrowing it, but um, it's just a Harbor Freight tubing roller. They're not super great, but if you want to roll tubing, it's very, very affordable and it works. It's just kind of finicky to use. And there are people that make upgrade kits for it that make it much, much better. But. Rogue Fab told us they might be working on one. I don't know if that's secret or not, but <laughs> we're hoping that they make one. This would be way, way better. So over here in this corner, I have all of the uh, boxes and boxes of like parts and stuff. So this whole bucket is just steering components, tie rods, rack and pinions, whatever, uh, you know, time joints. Steering arms, every, everything steering related is in that in that bucket there. Um, this whole box here, entirely brake parts. That's a whole box of brake calipers, master cylinders, brake lines. That's it. That's all that's in there. So you know we've got a few of those parts. <laughs> and then um, we also have back in the corner here, um, we have a whole bucket of whole bucket of random wires from stuff in case you need just short chunks of wire. I like to recycle and repurpose things whenever possible. So, um, you know, you often need just little short chunks of wire. Uh, so that's this whole bucket is that or little connectors you can repurpose. Um, and then here's our uh, whole box of hoses, fuel line, vacuum line, coolant lines, Anytime we take something apart and the hoses are salvageable, just throw them in this box because you never know what you're gonna need. And usually you can find it in here. Well, I just spilt a bunch of gasoline on the floor, but that's, uh, you know, daily occurrence. No. <laughs> Part of life. Part of life. <laughs> Part of life. So we haven't used it a whole lot, but I'm excited about doing things with it in the future. This uh, is just a Harbor Freight um, 36 inch metal brake, um, just for, for bending sheet metal. So. Especially if you're working with a little piece here, it's really easy. So you can just clamp it in there, boop, bend it. Over in this corner behind the piranha is the uh, one of the piles of scrap metal. So this is basically just whatever piece of scrap metal I brought in from the larger scrap pile, used a chunk of it, and then put it in the corner. <laughs> this, for the moment, is where we keep our round tube steel, which is most of what we use in terms of large quantities. Obviously we build all of our chassis and bumpers and stuff out of tubing. We typically use, uh, the most common size we use, and we get this asked this a lot, is a uh, one inch diameter, 083 wall thickness, just mild steel tubing. Um, it's very versatile. 083 is, I like this thickness because it's not too heavy, but it still bends well. So on a four and a half inch radius bend, you can do 180 degrees and it won't kink at all. If you go into a thinner wall tubing like 065, it's lighter weight, but it also kinks when you bend it too tight and it's not quite as strong. But then like 120 wall is very heavy and excessively strong um, for most applications. So that's what we use for that. Um, we haven't done a whole lot with inch and a quarter tubing, but uh, depending on the build, I'll, I'll start using more of that. Um, and then anything bigger like the roll cage on the Tacoma is inch and a half uh, tubing, 120 wall. And same thing applies with that is that the thicker wall bends nicer. So I've tried 083 wall inch and a half and it kinks a bit on the bender. So um, 
I like the 120 wall for its resistance to kinking. Um, and also if we're building something out of inch and a half tubing, we probably want it really strong. So the 120 wall is nice and sturdy for that. This here is my shelf of, uh, most of this is parts that I either have used on the lathe or will use like pieces of, uh, pieces of axle that I might need to turn down. Um, just, you know, round stock, basically anything that I might want to put on the lathe. I even have a big chunk of, uh, UHMW plastic stands for ultra high molecular weight. It's really hard and really resistant to wear. So a big chunk of that I can throw on the lathe and make round plastic parts uh, for like bushings and sleeves and stuff. Uh, we also have some chunks of large chunks of aluminum for making aluminum parts on the lathe. And then over here I have a pile of bends of exhaust tubing. So this is left over from the Camaro. And the reason we buy these pre-bent is because uh, this is super thin wall and without a mandrel setup, our bender can't bend that without just absolutely smashing it. It's just too thin a wall. Um, so you can find on eBay or Amazon or wherever, uh, you can find all sorts of like pre-bent pre assortments like this and then you can just chop them up and use them and weld it back together however you need it. So that's how we build our exhaust pipes, uh, unless or until we get a uh, mandrel attachment for our rogue fat bender, which they do make super cool. You guys will find this pretty entertaining. This is my bucket of bearings. Not everything in there is a bearing, but mostly, uh, just like, you know, there's some U joints and stuff as well, but it's mostly bearings from all sorts of different stuff. That's an idler wheel from a snowmobile. We've got, uh, Subaru timing belt bearings. Sam actually brought us those. He just did a timing belt on a Subaru. He was like, Hey, you want these bearings? Absolutely. I want those bearings. So, Again, that's my hoarderness, hoarding all the bearings that I've ever had, because you never know when you might need them. And then this is the uh, manual knockout punch thing that we use for the dimple dies, for the larger dimple dies. So this thing's super cool. It's just a little hand pump hydraulic dealio with a ram here and set it up with this. Throw that on there and you put your piece of steel with a hole this big in it um, and then you spin this on there and it'll just chop a nice clean hole through the steel so that's a super handy little thing for cutting large diameter holes in thin steel um, assuming you don't have a cnc plasma cutter which we don't so now that you've seen all the tools inside the shop we'll go outside and check out the scrap piles and the bone yard the uh all the mountains of bits and pieces of things. And then after that, we'll show you all the builds and do an update on everything and, and uh, keep you updated on that. So this is our scrap pile that's uh, basically ready to go to be recycled. Um, it's been buried in the snow all winter, so it has been growing. Uh, it's about time to get rid of that, but uh, largely everything in here isn't worth salvaging for anything. It's just, you know, ATV chassis and carcasses. Obviously there's our tire pile. <laughs> That's, we've accumulated all of those tires from, I mean, some of those are still tires that we use, like the paddle tires for Sendy and the racing slicks for Sendy, you know, stuff like that. But a lot of those are just worn out tires from things that we've bought and then upgraded the tires or when we went drifting or you know, whatever. So um, we are thinking about maybe making a tire wall on the rally track with those. So most of you have seen this scrap pile. This is the larger outdoor scrap pile where we have all this, um, all the big pieces or stuff that, you know, we don't need very often. Kind of a big mess right now, but again, that's because the snow has just melted. So all of this was buried in snow and I had to came out here and look for some things in the winter. So this will be all organized soon, uh, at least a little bit, maybe get rid of a bunch of the stuff that's not worth anything. There's also another pile of the really big chunks of steel leaning up against the back of the shed here. Um, again, this all came from my friend Chris's shop. This is all just the huge chunks that I have no idea what I'll ever do with, but I didn't want to see it just get sent to the scrapyard. So we've got a piece of like six inch square tube, piece of railroad track, you know, things you might need. This is the lean-to shed on the side of the shop where we store as many as we can fit of the current or past 
uh, projects. Now's a good time to do an update on all the builds since we're here. We'll talk about the Triumph. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this and don't know what it is, this is a 1962 Triumph Spitfire with, under the hood, a thousand cc, four cylinder, four stroke snowmobile engine that is supercharged, or some of you might say pro-charged because it's a turbo style turbine run by a belt. The company that makes the supercharger kit claims about 230 horsepower output with this setup as it is on here. So uh, if we get it tuned right, it's gonna be mighty quick because the whole car from the factory only weighed 1500 pounds and we've reduced that a good bit with this engine setup. So um, yeah, it's a super, super cool engine. It's actually basically a Yamaha R1 engine um, sport bike engine that they redesigned a little bit and stuffed into their snowmobiles back in the early 2000s. They went away from that setup because it's extremely heavy for a snowmobile. But uh, it's a super, super cool engine. But extremely light for a sports car. Exactly. Very, very light for a sports car. So here's the Odyssey. As you can tell, freshly painted and looking sharp. Um, Sam's been over helping us out one or two days a week working on this while I've been working on the uh, four-wheel drive power wheels. Um, as you can see, it's going back together. Still a lot to be done, but uh, we'll be getting it out and taking it for a rip very soon. Uh, we've got some new pistons for the engine, uh, rebuilding that as well. Uh, upgraded radiator, better radiator fan going on. So uh, as soon as we get it back together and running right, we're gonna take it out to some sand dunes and, you know, get it to where it was made for because it's way too fast and big for my property here. <laughs> it's not a uh, tight trails machine. It's a high speed shred monster. Here's the thing that started it all. The good old original Barbie Mustang. This thing has been through a lot and uh, it still runs and drives. Actually right now the um, sprocket uh, the drive sprocket adapter thing is broken, but that's a really easy fix. Just last time we drove it, it broke. We haven't had a chance or reason to fix it yet. Um, but, uh, we get a lot of questions of people saying like, oh, are you going to ever rebuild the Barbie Mustang? No, because this one's just like, the way we built it was the way we did at the time, but it's not the way we do it now. So if we were going to redo it, we would start from scratch completely because this body is also very thrashed from being, you know, rolled and rallied and <laughs> wrecked. <laughs> so this is just gonna stay in its current form. We'll bring it out to, you know, events and take it out on the track a few times still, cause it, it, it does still run and drive fairly well. It's just, you know, it's kind of a hack job compared to what we do now. The good old Camaro. It uh, did great on the track the other day. It's kind of a suicide machine. It may have suffered uh, a little bit of damage. We didn't, uh, we didn't show that because we didn't want to freak anybody out. Everyone's fine, the Camaro's fine. But, uh, so it, it still runs and drives, just needs a new seat and a new valve cover and it'll be back in business. Um, we'll, uh, We'll do some minor upgrades to it. Um, we've also talked about making this ro this body the off-road body and chopping the fenders on it to fit the off-road tires so we can have the off-road setup with the Camaro body. Um, so we'll see what we do there. But other than that, it's basically complete and you know it, it, it runs, it's reliable, uh, it's quite fast. So it's basically you know good to shred. We did talk about turboing it when we were building it after driving it the other day, no. <laughs> the last thing this needs is more power. I love making things super overpowered and ridiculous, but this thing with as short and narrow as its wheelbase is, it's completely uncontrollable with the amount of power it has already. So uh, we'll reserve forced induction for something that can actually deal with it in the chassis and setup. We painted it orange for the PUBG ad. You guys saw that video, obviously. Uh, and it actually looks really good orange. Um, so we're just gonna leave it. Um, the, uh, we may at some point get a different, another body, like if we wanna take it to SEMA again or something and make it look super pretty in street mode, uh, we may get another body and just 
you know, redo that and maybe do wide body kit or whatever on it. But um, we really like the orange, so we'll just stick with it. Um, Cinderella, on the other hand, which uh, in case there's any confusion, that's spelled S-E-N-D, Cinderella, not Cinderella. So, you know, play on words there because she's a Sandy monster. Everything's good with this. It runs like a champ. Um, Everything is good with the exception of this spindle here. Uh, it keeps wanting to bend. Um, part of that's my fault for the way I engineered it, engineered it. Part of it's just the sheer amount of abuse that these tires put on these spindles. So um, it is still uh, totally solid to run and drive for now. But uh, before we do anything crazy with it, I will uh, rebuild the front suspension yet again and maybe add in some front brakes. Um, also, very important, we will go back to pink. Blue is not the right color for her. Uh, parts of the body were painted originally anyway, so um, whenever we get time, we will strip it back down, sand it down, make it all nice and clean, uh, fix anything that needs to be fixed on the body, and then paint it a beautiful, fresh color of pink and bring it back to its original glory. The roto packs on the back, we're gonna keep that because it's super cool. Um, before we had the spare tire back here, but like on obviously a spare tire on this is really, really pointless. Whereas having extended fuel range is super handy and it looks awesome. So we'll keep that. We do actually need a skid plate for it though because I was wheeling at the track the other day and this is the first thing to touch the ground. So I'll need to make just a little basic wheelie bar skid plate thing so that when you do wheelies you don't rip your gas tank off. Also look at how much tire I burned off the other day at the track. These are uh, getting pretty cupped there. It's a good shred session. These tires are actually really good on pavement. Like super good. They, uh, they are DOT approved though so that makes sense. They're golf cart tires. Um, we get a lot of questions on those too. They're just a set of golf cart tires that we found on eBay. Um, you can't really buy them anywhere else that I've found. <laughs> They're just some weird, crazy golf cart wheel and tire combo that you can get for pimping out your golf cart. There's the Hurricane. Doesn't need a whole lot of uh, update there because it's what we've been working on lately, but um, the next steps on this are controls, wiring harness, uh, gas tank, oil tank, all the stuff to make it actually work. It's physically more or less complete, but now we need to make all the components work together. Um, so there's that. Also, uh, somebody, I don't remember who it was, came up with an excellent option for a name for this, which is Colonel Senders, to go along with the kind of the theme of Cinderella. But you know, it is kind of an army green Jeep and it's definitely the big boss. So I think I like Colonel Senders. <laughs> We can't forget the all-important crunchy taco. Uh, obviously one of our very original builds, as many of you know. Um, Toyota Tacoma, it was totaled. We got it, manual swapped it, built a cage, threw some 37s on it, and called it a day. Other than that, and welded discs, completely stock underneath. Uh, which is a lot of fun, and also breaks basically every time you do anything. So. Uh, possible plans for this in the future, forced induction because why not, uh, and a solid axle swap in the front to make it reliable and be able to take a beating because the engine and drivetrain, super awesome. Front axle setup, super, super weak. Uh, the suspension's actually great, it's just the, the front differential and CV axles and all of that that can't handle it. So. Um, we will probably just throw a solid axle under it and keep sending it, um, you know, assuming you guys are interested enough to keep watching it. Maybe we'll rally it around and do some donuts. It sat all winter. Battery wasn't even dead. This is still the, this is what amazes me. I've had a lot of batteries over a lot of years. I've never seen one as durable as this one because this battery sat in this thing for like three years when it was abandoned before we got it. We jump started it with my truck and the battery has been fine ever since. It wasn't on a battery tender or a charger. I didn't even have to jump start it. 
It just started right up today. I don't know how that's possible. It's just a really good battery. It wouldn't be a proper grind hard video if we didn't break something. So I've got to at least try to break something. Well, it's officially spring. I guess that's what this means. Everything's sufficiently muddy. That right there is what we call a North Idaho car wash. <laughs> well, clearly I didn't try hard enough to break it, so I'm gonna see if I can jump it out of the sand pit. So since we couldn't break the taco, now we're gonna try on the Jeep. Oh yeah, time to send it. And of course, there's the uh, murder machine original that took out Edwin's leg. <laughs> the uh, snowmobile mountain scooter thing. Right now it's set up half dirt, half snow. Still got the track on it. You may have seen it last time we went to the dunes. Um, this one, it was a cool idea, I guess. It was also a really dumb idea. Uh, it was really fun to build, but it's, it's like really not good to ride <laughs> it's really difficult really crazy so um we might throw the tire back on and take it to the dunes whenever we, when we take out the odyssey just to shred around this is a 1985 porsche 944 um, i bought this to have as a uh, daily driver track car just for fun car uh last winter um i picked it up over in seattle for two thousand dollars which was a good deal. Um, it ran and drove, I drove it home, and then I had it for less than a week and got in what should have been a very minor accident because I was driving in the snow. Uh, I slid through an intersection and hit a Subaru and it just wrecked the front end of this car. I don't know if we have any pictures of what it looked like, but it was just destroyed. I was going like 20 miles an hour and it, the, it just smashed it. So. I started building this tube front for it um, last summer, but it's just a project I don't have much time for, so um, eventually I'll get it going again. It still runs, it just needs a new radiator and a new <laughs> front end, but uh, I'll probably make it into a track car or something like that, because um, it is a super fun car to drive. The good old BMW Ute. We call it that because it's a pickup truck, a little pickup truck car size thing in other countries known as a ute, so namely Australia, I think. Anyway, uh, you know, you guys know when we built it, where we built it. We took it to the Gambler 500. It was super fun, still is, runs and drives great still. Um, not sure what we're going to do with it aside from rally the crap out of it and have fun with it. So if you want to see more of this let us know because we love it it just you know we don't have a lot of time to work on it because people tend to not care but it's a super fun little rally monster so 
you know, we could do some things to spruce it up. Give it some wishy noises, some bigger tires, some smaller tires, you know, various options. <laughs> and I'm sure you've noticed in the background of some of our videos, this tree house here, um, we have a whole video on this tree house and on the other one behind it uh, on the channel. We'll have links for those as well. There's going to be a lot of links in this description, aren't there? Yeah. It's going to just be a brick <laughs> of links. Oh, anyway, yeah. if you want to just look it up, there's videos on the tree houses explaining all them and showing them off. So you can check those out if you want to see more about that. But I built that tree house years ago and it's, uh, you know, still there. So I did something right. <laughs> And for the party bus, we're done with it. We're just gonna sell it. Um, my wife and I started doing it because we were gonna live in it and travel around, but now Grind Hard's a full-time gig. So we're gonna be here for a while. So we're gonna sell it to someone else who wants to travel around. So we finished the floor, finished the ceiling, finished the walls, did a bunch of insulation. That'll be for sale as soon as the driveway's good enough for it to actually drive out of here. So. If you're interested, if you want first dibs on it, send us an email, <laughs> but that's it for that. It would also make a, uh, it'd make a great donor for a uh, power stroke drivetrain. It does have a 7.3 power stroke. So, you know, you could buy it for that reason. Yep. <laughs> that's one reason why we've thought about keeping it. But yeah, but. It's a giant bus that could be more useful for something else. So. Right. Last but not least, we can't forget about the Jaggernaut or Jagenstein or any one of its other nicknames, but uh, you know, Jaguar XJS with 30 inch tires and a barely running V12 that's down to 11 cylinders and a single carburetor instead of fuel injection. You know, it's been through some action. Uh, we have a few different directions we could go with this. We're still trying to decide what we want to do, but it's a super cool old car and it looks awesome with these giant tires super low. So we've uh, talked about putting that four wheel drive drivetrain under it. That's still an option. We might just throw a much bigger and better, well, maybe not bigger, a much better engine in it uh, and keep it low and two wheel drive because that would also be super cool. So we're still figuring out the options for that one, but. It's been on hold all winter anyway, just because it's too big to even work on in the shop. So this is the uh, all important shop dog. Not that he spends much time in there. This is Bjorn. He's currently acting like a cow eating grass. Bjorn, say hi to the camera. Oh, over there. <laughs> and there's his brother. That's his brother, Frederick. Frederick, come here. Oh, Frederick. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh, well, yeah, yep. Bjorn likes to bite his brother. They're a little bit crazy. They're good boys. He's the lazy one. Anyway, uh, also, this is the Bobcat 853 skid steer. Um, largely, I use it for plowing snow in the winter and you know, dragging logs around for firewood just around the place, but we also use it for moving around broken cars or picking up engines or what have you. It's a very handy piece of machinery. I bought it uh, years ago when I was doing construction a lot and, um, and I kept it because it's a super awesome machine. Ah.